I am Jennifer Farley. My blog is Savory Simple. I, um, this is a second career for me. Um, I'm a full-time food blogger now, but um, for years, um, I was kind of all over the place. I, I graduated from Towson University in 2000 with, a, with an English degree, and then I went and got Microsoft certified, because what else would you do with an English degree? <laughs> so um, with my Microsoft certification, I went and I worked for 10 years almost at a photography company. It was a school photography company, and that's where I got my first SLR camera. And that is where I started ex experimenting with Photoshop. I sort of became the de facto Photoshop editing person there because we were shooting a lot of children and there were a lot of boogers. <laughs> and nothing gets you ready for cloning out crumbs like boogers. So I yeah, had to zoom right in, it was great. Um, and then I got tired of that after a little while. And uh, in 2009, I started Savory Simple just as, a, just as a hobby blog, just for fun. I certainly didn't think it would turn into anything. And at the beginning of 2010, I went to L'Academy de Cuisine, and, uh, which is just outside of Washington, D.C. Graduated and worked in restaurants for a while, which was just as horrible as I thought it was going to be. And uh, then I started doing, doing this. I went to a conference, and they're like, you can make money blogging. And I'm like, what? <laughs> And that was a really good choice because uh, I, I really love what I do. I'm, so I'm a full-time food blogger, a freelancer, and I also teach photography classes and workshops locally. And I'm hoping to eventually be able to teach them online. So Photoshop is, is the most advanced editing software that's out there. Um, it's incredible. Um, and I think part of the reason that people get so overwhelmed is because there's so much in there when you open the program. You don't know, you don't know what to do. You don't know where to start. Uh, the, the, the truth is you only need maybe 15 to 20% of what's in there to do everything that we want to do. I mean, they've got stuff for animation and graphics and comics, and you don't need most of it, which is really great. <laughs> and I'm going to show you how to figure out exactly what to use and what to ignore. Uh, and if you use Lightroom, it does a lot of the same kind of things. Um, I pulled in some before and after photos just to show you some, some of the things that you can do. Unless you're very new to photo editing, you're probably familiar with a lot of things like uh, improving the brightness and contrast and the levels of an image, removing a yellow cast. This image had a, a bit of a yellow cast. A lot of times images will either sway yellow or blue, so I corrected that. I targeted specific saturation, um, the greens and the apples, the blue of the backdrop, the oranges, um, targeted specific spots that I wanted to be even brighter than they were, certain highlights, and I cloned out some spots on the backdrop. And uh, that's that one. <laughs> And, you know, the stuff that you can do also applies to, it's not just for food, it's for travel photography, it's for your headshots, it's for everything. Um, and I really like this one because there was a really strong blue cast in her bumblebee suit. And so I got rid of that and I also removed, there was a really strong shadow and I, I made it less intense. And, um, and I made it so you could see her face better because her face was completely shadowed out. And, and, you know, I enhanced the colors and the sky and the grass and just uh, made it m much more of an eye-catching photo. And uh, <laughs> 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 I wasn't sure I wanted to do this, but I decided to do it. And I actually think you can't see everything great on this, but we, we, we have the option to go through this step by step. So maybe you can see it a little bit better later. Um, for my headshot, for this headshot in particular, that day that I had this done, I'm not sure if this has ever happened to any of you, but I had my, I had my makeup done because I just wanted it to look really good. And whatever she used on my face made me look like I had really dry, flaky skin. So I smoothed that out. I made myself look a little less tired by getting rid of some of the eye bags and the red eyes. Um, and then I whitened my teeth a little bit. And then when I was zoomed in to whiten my teeth, I noticed I'd been chewing on my lip and I had a big lip chunk. So I fixed that. 
And like no one else is going to look at this and think this is edited, but I notice, and it makes me feel better about it. So you can do this kind of stuff. So um, if any of you were having trouble downloading this before, you would like to follow along, you can grab everything, including the workbook. Uh, the, these are smaller versions, but there's going to be just a big, bigger one that you can print out at home and see everything a little better, or just look at it on your computer even. Um, so a lot of the stuff, if it seems overwhelming when I'm going through it, um, I've put a lot of information into this workbook that you can sort of read later and go through it. And the slideshow is going to be available. All the photos are going to be available. So you don't have to follow along, but it's an option. So at first I was going to go I'm not, don't leave. <laughs> really, that's what I'm trying to say here, is just don't leave me. I know there's a wonderful mobile session going on in the other room. Um, I'm, I'm gonna, you guys are going to be able to ask me a lot of questions. If there's anything that you're not understanding, I'm going to, it's your night. I'm going to try to make this um, not make your brains melt. But if you feel like your brains are melting, I can slow down. Um, you can do it. You can do it. You're going to know Photoshop after this. It's going to be great. Um, to make it sound less intimidating, um, the three things that I'm really going to just focus on today in a nutshell are um, just removing some of the mystery and the intimidation from Photoshop and making it just seem more straightforward. There's only a few really incredible, powerful tools that you want to get the most out of that you can't get in Lightroom or some of these other programs. Um, and specifically, I'm going to be focusing on layers, cloning, and masking, which are just three of my favorite things. Um, and I'm also going to just show you some shortcuts and tips that help me get my work done. And, um, and if you're already comfortable using Lightroom, you can still do everything that you already do in Lightroom, but then you can if you want to do some of these extra steps, you can bring it into Photoshop afterwards just to do those finishing touches. So just to give you a sense of how we're going to do this, I'm going to start with a little slideshow slide show presentation so you can to make sure that you guys are on the same page and you understand a few of the concepts that I'm going to be talking about, words I'm going to be throwing out while I'm doing the demo. Um, and I'm going to have some time for a Q&A right at the end of this, um, or we can launch right in if there's no questions. And then during the demo, um, I kept it pretty loose. Um, I have a bunch of different things I want to show you how to edit. And if we have extra time, I can go back in more detail. I can show some things that you might be curious about that I haven't covered. Um, we can really just sort of, I want it to be interactive. I, I would love to not just talk at you guys the whole time because I think that you'll get a lot more out of it if you, you ask questions. Um, and I might let you know if your question is about to be answered momentarily. But other than that, we can just get right into it. So that's today. Uh, I wanted to start with an overview of Lightroom versus Photoshop because a lot of people ask me what the difference is. They are very, very similar. Um, you can use both of them for doing a lot of basic edits on your photos, for applying presets, which are wonderful, and we'll get into them, um, and optimizing and saving your photos for your blog, which, as we all know, is very, very important for SEO right now. Um, and you can, do, you can get both of the programs in the Adobe CC Photography Plan for $10 a month. And you get one, you get the other. And I love doing that plan because every time they do an update or they release a new feature, you automatically just get it. Whereas I think if you buy just the regular Photoshop, you're late. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You're fine. Um, yeah, I, I like doing the $10 per month because I think it's worth it to have the constant uh, fixes coming down. And it's just, they're, they're such great programs. Um, Lightroom has an easier interface when you first look at it because it's missing a lot of the advanced tools. 
but it's really great for basic editing and it has some really nice organization options that Photoshop doesn't have and that is one place where Lightroom does excel. Like, and I don't even know how to do it, but you can, you can search things by keywords, I think, and, and you know, have, pull all your cake recipes up at once. Um, Photoshop doesn't have that organization system built in, but um, you can use another program that comes with the photography plan called Bridge, or you can just create your own system, which is what I do. I like to be in charge of organizing my files, so they're all just in folders, and I can search for them, and that's it. And with Photoshop, you get all of these advanced retouching tools that you don't get in any of these other programs. Um, and again, I've said layers and cloning. Um, and then I want to discuss Camera Raw before I jump into this, because Camera Raw is a big part of Photoshop. It comes with Photoshop but it's kind of its own little separate program. And what it is, is if you shoot with RAW, if you shoot with JPEG, which a lot of people do, even a high resolution JPEG, it opens the file immediately in Photoshop. If you shoot in RAW, which I highly recommend everyone does, you will have your images first open, open in Camera RAW before they open in Photoshop. And Camera RAW is kind of like Photoshop's version of Lightroom. So I'm, what I was saying before is if you already use Lightroom, you can do Lightroom to Photoshop. But if you, if you don't want to use Lightroom, you can just do Camera Raw to Photoshop, and it's all really in the same program. And that'll make more sense when you yeah, see is it. Is there an option to set it to Camera Raw will automatically open? Because I haven't been able to do that. I mean, like, I'll, I'll import images, and they will just open in Photoshop. They're not opening in Camera Are they raw or JPEG? Oh, no, they're raw. So I don't know. Maybe there's... I'll have to look at I'll take a look at, at that with you after, because I'm not sure what's going on there. Um, so you can do a lot of things in Camera Raw that are very similar to what you would do in Lightroom. You can correct lens distortion. You can do lots of editing to the image, to the brightness, to the saturation, to the white balance without making any change, without like harming the file. You can save the, um, you can save the images for your website. Um, with Photoshop, this is the default that opens for JPEG. And this is where you can do all of your fine tuning. So I like to think of Camera Raw as something that you mainly want to use to edit the whole image. And then Photoshop is something that you would want to do if there's particular spots in an image that you want to fine tune. And that's really the easiest way. So when, to you're, it. So when you, you open this image up in, in Camera Raw and then it sends it over to Photoshop, what type of file is it when it ends up in Photoshop? It's still raw. Okay but it won't let you save as a raw file. So once you open it in Photoshop, it's a great question. Once you open it in Photoshop, you're officially moving into JPEG mode because it won't let you save. It will save all of the changes that you make in Camera Raw, and I think that's coming right up how that works. But then as soon as you open it in Photoshop, any of those layers that you make, any, any, any fine tuning, any cloning, you have to save it as a JPEG or a Photoshop file or something similar after that. But if you're, if you're sending it straight from Lightroom to that same thing? Yes. Okay. And I think, and I don't want it, um, they, they're changing it all the time. Last time I looked, I think you had to save it from Lightroom as a JPEG and then open it in Photoshop. But I wouldn't be surprised if they've in, created something to just export it directly into Photoshop. Okay. Excellent. Glad I have some Lightroom people here. And if you're used to Lightroom, the camera raw interface is probably going to look very familiar to you. It's, it's, the same, it's, the, it's a lot of the same things, just in a slightly different place. So, and I just, you, this might be familiar to some of you, but I just want to touch briefly on raw versus JPEG, unless, just so make sure that if I'm talking about that, you're not scratching your head wondering what I'm talking about. Um, raw files are uncompressed images that you can shoot in your camera that save, they're huge, that's the negative about them, but they save all of the data and they give you the highest quality, brightest, most sharpest images. 
and you can edit them until the end of time without harming, harming that image. So what it does with a raw file is any edits that you make, and I have a picture of it coming up, are actually saved to a little document where it tells, it almost tells camera raw or Lightroom what edits you've applied, but the original image underneath stays the same. You still have to save it as a JPEG ultimately, but you can always go back and you can fix, you can, you can make unlimited changes without harm, harming it, and you can always go back to the original version. JPEGs, even the highest resolution one, they, you lose some data in the compression process. And any editing that you do harms the quality of the file. So I think at some point we've all taken an image and done a lot of things to it, and it starts having that kind of sharpened, grainy look. That's what happens when you edit a JPEG. And you, and you can do several edits without it being a problem, but you can't, like if something is, is almost completely underexposed or almost completely overexposed, you really can't do that much before it starts to look horrible. You have a ton more capability for editing with RAW. You just need a storage system for it. So you want to use RAW images when you really, really care about your photography. Like, if, you know, not everyone cares that much about the photography, but that's a big part of your site. And you want to do freelancing for, for brands and sell your photography as, it, as, a, as, as a selling point, RAW is really the best way to go. So, and it's, it's good for full image edits. It's bad for pinpoint edits. So you, it doesn't have the same abilities. It has some, but you can't do good quality cloning and dodging and burning, and we're going to get to all of that. And it's bad for the internet because these files are huge. Um, what I like to do and what a lot of other people like to do um, is use Amazon as a web service that you can back up to, and they automatically back up to the cloud every night, and it's like $3 a month for several terabytes of data. So I use RAW for my first edits, and then I use JPEG for saving a, fin a finished high-resolution image, and then for saving it an optimized version for my website. In summary, I shoot RAW, I do the full edits in RAW, and then I save those final edits that I do as JPEGs. Real quickly, the way that raw images save that data, I was just saying there's a little file that has everything on it, all that information on it. It's, it's, it'll have the same name as your image, and it'll have .xmp on it, and if you open it, it'll be gobbledygook. <laughs> and if you rename that XMP file, or you move it to a different folder, or you delete it, you get back to your original raw file. So that XMP file is where all of your data is saved instead of in the image itself, which is what happens with JPEGs. I just wanted you guys to understand that. So if you see that file, if you start playing around with this, you know what it is. You don't have to open it. Just know that it's there and know why it's there. I'm not going to get into the histogram a lot because it's complicated. <laughs> um, it's not too complicated, but I just, it's not, it's not the purpose of today. But I do want to make any of you who aren't familiar with the histogram just aware of its existence, what it does, and then you can sort of start keeping an eye out for it when you're shooting because it will help make you a better photographer and a better photo editor. Um, you'll see one in your camera. Almost every camera will have one. Every digital camera will have one on the display. Um, and pretty much every good quality I don't know about something like PicMonkey, but um, most image editing softwares are going to have a histogram. And when you look at it, it's showing you the number of pixels. It's showing you dark to light. And you can tell by the data in there, like it, while you're shooting, you can tell if something is blown out or really underexposed. So it's, it's a, I just, and you're going to see it in Photoshop and you're going to see it in Camera Raw. So I just wanted to sort of point it out. And you can tell from looking at histograms, if you don't even look at the photo, you can tell what kind of image you're looking at. So here we're looking at a dark image. All of the shadows are over here. We've got all of the brights over here. That's it. That's it for now. <laughs> 
as I said, the more that you pay attention to that, and when you have a bad photo and you're trying to figure out what's wrong, you can sort of look at it and start to see if it gives you information. It's worth looking into. It's worth keeping an eye on. I just added this slide earlier, and this is a whole heck of a lot of information. I added this after a great conversation with Katie from Healthy Seasonal Recipes. And you, I mean, we're not, you don't have to read all of this right now, but I have the slideshow available to download, and I just wanted to make sure that you guys come away understanding these three concepts, because these are three of the most powerful concepts in Photoshop. Layers, layer masks, and adjustment layers. And layers, that's the, basic of how, the basis of how Photoshop works. Um, you can think of them like pieces of glass. And each piece of glass, they're lying on top of each other. You can change their order around. You can move them over, you can get rid of them, you can add them back later. They give you a lot of flexibility in layering up changes. Layer masks are fantastic. They're kind of like erasers, but they're like undo redo erasers. So if you instead if you erase something, like let's say let's say that there's a there's a crumb or like a, a stem or something that you want to get rid of. Um, if you erase it and you accidentally go too far into the cilantro, um, you have to undo everything that you've done. But with a mask, and it'll make more sense when I show it to you, you can get rid of stuff, but if, and then you can, like, you can keep fine-tuning on either side. That'll make much more sense when I show it to you. It's great. You're going to love it. And then adjustment layers are a way to to edit, to make specific changes in Photoshop, and then adjust the individual layers and mask them and apply them only to specific areas. So if, that, if that's not making a lot of sense, it's OK. I'm going to show you. I just wanted to point them out. That was it. All right, thank you. Um, before I, go into, before I go into the demo, does anyone have any questions? Cool. So I'm going to go into the, the number one folder. And I'm going to open not the PSD file, but I'm going to open the Acai granola smoothie bowl, the cilantro lime dressing, and the key lime pie. And if you have Photoshop, hopefully you do. <laughs> if you're following along, we're going to open them in Photoshop. One of the first things that I like to do when I open images in Camera Raw is take a snapshot of them. And a snapshot will let me see how something looked originally after I made changes. And you can make as many snapshots along the way as you want. And that way, if you don't like a change that you've made or you're trying to figure out the direction that you want to go with a, a picture, it gives you a lot of, you can go back and forth. You can look, you can revert. So the very last tab is snapshots. And this is one of those extra things you don't really have to do. You can just click the new button down there. There's a new and a trash. And I'm going to call it one. I'm going to go into all of these. And I'm going to make a new snapshot. And I'm just going to call it one. The snapshots are the last tab on the right. Jen, I'm really sorry, but once we have the photos on our screen, how, do you, how did you open them into Photoshop? Well, you can just try double-clicking them and seeing if, you op if they open that way. But I, some, I like to right-click, and then it, it asks me which one to open with. I'm on, a, yeah, I'm on a Mac. Looks like you're on a Mac, too. So, so we've got these three snapshots. We've got all these photos. And... After I've made snapshots, or even if I don't make snapshots, one of the first things I like to do if I'm shooting with RAW is do something called correcting the lens distortion. 
the distortion will not be that severe sometimes if you have, depend, depending on the kind of lens you have, you'll have a different level of distortion, but there's a tab right in the middle. So you see where I am? So the one that says lens correction, and I've highlighted all of them, so if it's just gonna do them at once, if you do like a shift A or however it is with your operating system or control A, and then I click the little button that says enable profile correction. And it's really subtle, but what it does is it gets rid of um, bad vignetting around the outside. And it also, um, lenses tend to like bow a little bit. So, you know, if you're shooting something round, this will help correct any distortion you get from that. So that's something I really like to do. And then with the interface here, we've got several, we've got different buttons on the top and we've got these different panels over here. I do wanna focus more on these panels than these buttons, but these buttons are great. And if we have time, we can certainly look at them later. Um, the basics tab is the one that's all, all the way to the left, and you can see things like white balance, exposure, contrast, highlights, vibrance. If you do work in Lightroom, you're used to changing a lot of these things. Question. I was trying to open up your photos in the clips. I missed the very beginning when you said what you opened. This, I missed the very basic beginning when you said what you opened to get to that screen. Oh, I just opened the images, and it opened. If, if you have raw images that you're opening, they should open directly into Camera Raw. So once you're in here, you can you can do all kinds of things. Um, you can you can correct the white balance. If you guys are not super familiar with white balance, everything usually has either a blue yellow tint or a green magenta tint. So a lot of times, if your image looks off, shifting these around will help you solve any casting issues, any, if you have like a little bit of, a lot of times photos will have either the yellow cast, which drives me crazy. And so I like to make sure that they're a little bit cool toned. Um, and this- How do you get that sidebar if it's not there when raw? Your in camera raw? Yeah, like when my, I don't have my computer, but like when, when, when I open a raw image, that sidebar, if it's not always there. That's going to be really hard for me to help you troubleshoot without having it in front of me. <laughs> but um, a lot of times, if you can't find things that should be there, and this is in any program, if you go up to like the file view, you might be able to say like reset workspace, something like that. I know that's a big one in regular Photoshop once we get there that will help you. So with images like this, you can, you can up the exposure, you can up the contrast. I'm a big fan of this one down here called Clarity. A lot of people don't use Clarity, they'll use the sharpening tools, but I think Clarity actually ends, adds a really nice amount of, um, if you ever aren't sure what something does, the best way to do, the best thing to do is take that panel and that little slider and slide it all the way back and forth. And you can see what the extreme versions are and then you can sort of understand a little bit about what it does and Clarity just, Gives you clarity, gives you a little bit of crispness. And dehaze, it's the same thing. What does dehaze do? We go that way, that's kind of hazy. We, we go this way, it's a little more dark and rich. And if you have a, if you have an image that was shot on a foggy day, or if your lens got fogged up from steam, dehaze will fix it. And then another thing that I like to do in here is you've got these highlights and these shadow sliders. And sometimes if you go the opposite direction that you think that they should go, you're gonna get a nice contrasting effect. So this is a nice dark shot. And I'm hoping you guys can see this on that screen since it's not my monitor. When you, when you bring it up, you actually, you're not really getting rid of the darkness of the photo, but you're bringing some of the texture of the background in. And it can create a nice look. And with vibrance and saturation, they're very similar. Um, I think one has something to do with skin tones. I usually just putz around with them until I get a look that I like. Bring that down a little bit. So 
So this is the basics tab. They've also, under the white balance, a lot of programs have this. They've got all their different settings, uh, settings like white balance, um, like daylight, auto, cloudy, da 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 da. Yeah. I have a question. I know that it's um, preferable to um, shoot in RAW and to edit the RAW file like you're doing. But if you happen to have a JPEG, could you still do the same thing with it? Sort of. There's something called the camera raw filter, and I will show you that. And if I forget, raise your hand and I'll remember. Yes, but you can't, it's not gonna be the same um, in terms of maintaining the quality of the image, but you're going to be able to access the things that I'm using right now, except for lens distortion. So that's the first tab. We've also got one tab over, we've got tone curve, and that's got a lot of, um, I'm not really going to get into curves today too much. I want to sh like just show you that it exists, but that's pretty advanced editing. And um, what I like to do just for some basic tweaking is there's something in RAW called the parametric. Fancy word, it just means you can individually adjust the highlights, lights, darks, and shadows. And this can be, you know, an interesting way. I'm gonna, I'll show you a bright photo next so you can sort of see, because I know a lot of people don't shoot dark and moody. I like to do a combination, but you know, you can play with these on a different level and get and play with your effects and come up with something that you like. Do you generally find yourself doing the same thing as us? Like for, if you're certain, like for your certain style, like if you're shooting dark and moody, do you find yourself doing the same curves? I do, and that's where presets come in, because you can, with a preset, you, it's, you can basically that's going to be the second to last tab. Okay. You can save right. as many settings as you want and then just go back in. It's especially useful for one photo shoot if you've shot in the mm -hmm. same light at the same, t same time of day and you can like select the images and then just apply that one preset yeah. to all the things. Okay. Um, we've got the HSL adjustments tab, which is really nice for if you just you know, you don't want to saturate the entire image, but you want to saturate or make certain things be highlighted. Um, sometimes I think those really actually do well, regardless of whether they're dark images or bright images. Um, sa saturated stuff does well on Pinterest, if that's something that you're trying to do. So you can see on the top left of this picture, there's some mint. And if I go to the green slider, I can make it look really disgusting, <laughs> or I can make it look kind of alien. But if I go somewhere in the middle, it just gives it kind of this nice little pop. And I might want to make it so, it's, I can do that with the blue. I can take the reds and I can make them a little bit more pinkish. This is something that can be um, really fun to play with, and that's why I picked this photo, just to show you the different kinds of things you can do when you have specific colors that you want to target. Um, so for the saturation, I can now take that green and it vanishes if I do that, but it doesn't do too much because it's kind of dark there. But let's look at the purples. You can really saturate those. You can, you can, you can just, this is where you can get creative and you can make something look kind of ridiculous. <laughs> or you can make it just, you know, you do you, do, do what you think is beautiful. Luminance is also a really nice way to make things pop or make them push into the background. So, for example, if we go back to the green mint, if I take it all the way to the right and I made it a lot more luminous, you can see it a lot better than if I make it really dark. So that is really just about brightening or darkening specific colors in an image. What's the difference between hue and saturation? Hue is actually changing the hue of something. So if you have, it's, it's the hue. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm going to skip split toning for now, but that's fun, play with it. Um, we've already visited the lens correction. And over on the effects tab, it says FX, it's really easy. If you are doing dark and moody, and you see where post-crop vignetting is, that's a really interesting place to sort of bring, you know, if I get rid of it, if you go in the opposite direction, you get this. If you go 
down, you can sort of, that's when you see those dark photos that really zoom in your eyes right towards the center, that's vignetting. So, then up here, we have the presets tab, and that's what I keep hinting at. You can do presets in Lightroom, you can do presets in Photoshop, you can buy them from other people, you can make your own, but um, I'm giving you all of the presets today if you want to see how I got the effects that I got, because then you can actually, what's great about presets is especially, there's a lot of presets for sale that I don't think are very good, but what's interesting about them, if you can buy them from a photographer that you like, you can look at all of their settings and see how they got the look they got. Like if there's something that's especially great with like a really editorial thing. So all you have to do, so like this is what I did just now, but if I have one over here called Acai Berry Smoothie Bowl, and if I click it, that's what I did the other day. Um, and down here, you've got a new button and a trash button, and that's how you make new buttons. You can have 50 settings or one setting that you've adjusted, and you make a preset, you never have to do that again. So if you find yourself making, if, if the only thing you do in here is lens correction, you can just make a preset called lens correction, click it, open, you're done. And so if I were to make another snapshot right now, and just call it two, I can go and look at the original and the new. And then I'm just gonna, without going through that whole thing again, I'm going to show you what I did with this cilantro lime dressing. And then with my key lime pie. Very little needed to be done to the pie. So there's one other thing I want to show you in raw, and then I want to get into Photoshop, because like the meat and the bones of Photoshop. There are these, so we were talking about the histogram earlier, and we've got the histogram up in the top corner. And if you, it's got these little buttons on either side. And these little buttons are fantastic because what you can do with them is you can see if any of your image is blown out. Um, and it's fine if like, if, 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 you know, if highlights are blown out. Let me show you what I mean. I'm gonna take this exposure and I'm gonna make it as exposed as I can possibly make it. The whole image is red. That is how I know, if that's how I opened the image, and I pull down the exposure, you know, it's fine to have a little bit of exposure, like a little overexposure, like in a highlight, like you've got on the forks, you can see a little bit of red there, but um, that's a really useful tool for you to have while you're editing to make sure you're not actually blowing things out. Or if you open something and you actually accidentally shot it while it was a little bit blown out or a little underexposed, you can fix it in camera raw. And that data will still be there differently than if you shoot JPEG. And the shadows have one too. So that just looks like it's a black photo, but it's actually. Hmm? Yeah. I just killed it. In theory, I'll show you later, there should be. Normally it would show up blue where I'm blowing it out, so we won't worry about that for now because I have too many things I want to show you. <laughs> so to open all of these in Photoshop, you can open one in Photoshop, you can open all in Photoshop. I'm going to just open, I'm going to open them all. So I'm going to do just select all, open. And there's my teeth. <laughs> I had them. I had work done on them. So I want to take you guys for a look around the Photoshop interface. So hopefully it looks a little less um, overwhelming. Uh, the great thing about this interface, like I said, is you only need a very small amount of it. And you can hide all of the things that you don't need. And I've got more about this in the workbook than I can probably cover here, but if you 
up at the top under window, there's workspace. I actually made a workspace called Jen's workspace where I deleted every single thing and every single tool is hidden that I don't need. So if you go to their, it's like if I look at their default workspace, there's a lot of tools here and I don't even, like there's colors and swatches and this thing and that thing and libraries and adjustments and channels and paths and all these things that you don't need. All you have to ever do to make your own is drag out all the things you don't want and X out of them. You can go into the toolbars, get rid of the stuff that you don't want, and then save it, and you have a very simplified workspace. So they also have one for photography, but I don't like all the stuff in there. But if you're going into edit photos and you want to try a simplified one, you can try the photography one, and then you can start tweaking it. And then where it says new workspace, a uh, new workspace, you can just save your own. So the main things that I like to focus on, let me move around a little bit, are the layers palette. Um, we've got the properties and the history palette. We've got the navigator. And I closed the histogram before, but I like to keep the histogram up there usually. And then I've got specific tools that I like, and you guys don't even need all these tools. We're not going to cover all of them. And then up at the top, no matter what tool you're on, right now I have the clone stamp, or uh, yeah, the clone stamp selected. Every tool just has some specific settings, and they're up there. The most important one, the one that I spend the most time in, is the layers palette, which is down here. And that's where you're going to find all of the stuff that I was talking about before. The layers, the layer masks, the adjustment layers, and this is where Photoshop really shines. So down here, where you have the layers palette, you've got a few buttons down here. And there's one that will make a new layer. And if you hover over these, they tell you what they are. But you can create a new layer. And I've got this highlighted in the workbook. You can delete a layer. You can also drag these things. So you can at any time drag a layer to the new layer box, and it will just duplicate it. You can also do adjustment layers, which I'll get into. And you can make layer masks, which I'll get into a little bit more, but those are those that wonderful like undo redo thing. So and in the workbook, I've also got there's a few places up here on the main bar that I find myself going to often. So I've highlighted all of them. Um, I would recommend looking at them on your own time, just because if I spout them all off right now without showing you what they are, it's not going to mean anything, but they're the ones that I use the most often, and I do think that you're going to find a lot of use out of them. So one of the things that I like to do when I first go into Photoshop is I like to look at, um, at the different auto settings to see if Photoshop notices something that I don't see. And that is under image. And then you see auto tone, auto contrast, auto color. Sometimes if something feels off with an image and I click on one of these or all of them, it just fixes them. And I'm like done, flatten, save, upload. Um, so let's look at auto contrast, didn't do anything. Auto color just kind of brought back some of the shadows. Auto tone made it a little bit more blue. Let's, let's leave this how it is for now. But what I'm going to do, one of the most common questions that I get is about cloning. And this crust it was very crumbly, and it fell apart a little bit while I was plating it. And this is a really, really good opportunity for me to show you guys the two great tools that I like to use for fixing spots.
We've got the clone stamp, that's the classic one, that's the one most people talk about, and then we've got the spot healing tool. And the spot healing tool can be great and really fast, um, not always as accurate as the clone stamp. One thing I recommend doing to save you guys time is, so when you, again, when you highlight over anything, it gives you um, an explanation of what it is. And all of these things have a letter that are assigned with them. And you can actually go into the settings and change that letter. So clone stamp, if I want to grab that tool, I just hit S. And it saves me a lot of time. So like if I, and zoom is Z. So if I want to stamp and then zoom, you know, I can zoom in closer. And then I can go back to the clone stamp by hitting S without doing anything. So a lot of the stuff where I'm showing you, and it might look like she does that for every photo, it takes me five seconds because I'm just hitting letters and jumping back and forth. You've also got this navigate, navigator where you can drag around and look at the images. What, what did you do? So, the navigator, I just moved my mouse over to it. That is this. So that doesn't come up on mine. How do I pull something like that up? Is that from, okay, so, from the, from the so you can, you can, you can try like their photography workspace to start before you make your own. And the other thing you can do is once you know what these things are, if one of them vanishes, under that window, and that's what I'm saying, like we barely need any of these things, those are all the different panels that they have. 3D, actions, adjustments, brush settings, characters. So um, the navigator is checked because I have it there. The histogram was hidden, but I can put it there. And the navigator has, is nice because you can take this and you can drag it around to different parts of the images of the image. And also at the bottom, you've got these little sliders where you can zoom in and out if you don't feel like using the zoom key. Does that make sense? Is everybody with me? Yes. Does anyone need a bad joke or something? We can wake up. I'm in mode and... Sorry, I haven't you got the button on? Yes. Yes. Okay. But you haven't done anything. I have not done anything. So I see a few things in here that I would like to clean up. It's mostly mostly pretty good, but I would like to clone. I would like to fix where the where the crust fell apart. And like some crumbs fell down here. You know, sometimes some days I'm feeling pickier than others. Some days I just want to get the photo done. But for cloning, you you can clone onto a blank layer or a duplicated layer. It doesn't matter. If you, um, I'm just going to clone onto a new layer. And what you do is you have to select a spot that you want to clone from. So if I'm trying to fix it here, I'm looking over here, and this looks fine. So I'm going to hit Alt. And then I'm going to select the area. I'm just going to tap on it. How do you change the size of your cloning brush? That is a great question. The easiest way to do it, it's those shortcut keys again. Use brackets. Just use your, your two brackets, and it will make your brush smaller or larger. And if you want to do a different shape or change the, um, like whether it's a hard brush or a soft brush, you can do this here. And you can also make your brushes less intense by adjusting the opacity and the fill. And a lot of times opacity and fill can be used interchangeably. For today's purposes, they can be used interchangeably. So what, you press Alt to select the area? You press Alt to select the area that you want to clone from. So you can go from either the left or the right side of the crest. Yes. No, just the brackets. Mm -hmm. And and again, I think I looks like I'm in good company, but I am on a Mac, so some of the keyword, the some of the shortcuts might be different if you're on a PC. So we're gonna do, we're gonna start cloning. We're just gonna start drawing, and you can see the little. I'm going to actually pull the flow down. I usually like adjusting the flow more than the opacity for reasons. And I'm going to just start. The thing that I like to do with cloning is pick 
from different, different spaces and maybe adjusting the size of my brush periodically. Because if you clone from the same source too many times, you're gonna be able to see the same thing happening. And we had photographers that would try to do that at our, at our studio sometimes, even though they weren't allowed to, and I caught them every single time. Jen, are there different um, shape brushes? Because I... Yes. I there are infinite, infinite like if I'm doing an area that's in a corner... Oh, um, fantastic. Know. So, for a corner, well, there are square brushes, and you can, you, the brushes are up here, okay. and more often than not, what you want to do if you're getting a corner is just make a smaller brush that's harder. <laughs> so the, 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 if, if your brush is 0% hardness, that means it's very fuzzy on the outside. And if you make it all the way on the other side, like, so let's, let me do this. So I've got a hard brush now. So, like, if you'd make that really small and then you zoom in really close, yeah. you're going to be getting that sharp edge. And then if it's too intense or not intense enough, that's when you want to come in and adjust the flow or the opacity. And, and one other, yeah, no, please. So apologize. <laughs> the difference between, say, just using the clone tool versus, say, just using a paintbrush that you define, because I've done that before, right? Picked up color, done you know the color drop. Picked up the color with paintbrush, and filled in using the paintbrush. Maybe with fuzzy edges. Is the clone the concept? Being you're getting the texture. If it's you get the, the circle getting the texture. To everything, everything that's not like painted has a natural pixelation to it, yeah. and you want to try to always clone in that natural pixelation, or it's going to look fake. And I think that's been my problem. Yes. Is that it's going to look fake? Okay. So. We're going to do this a little bit more, and you don't have to do, like grab from exactly where I'm grabbing from. You can just clone it in. And then what I'm noticing as I get higher up is that maybe this is going to look a zoom height too fuzzy near the top. So and let me zoom in a little more. The zoom height. So <laughs> what I might do here is make the brush a little less hard and a little smaller. And just do a little more cloning, just a little bit of cloning. I just made that up. And now I can see some things I might like to fix because I'm a little bit like crazy detailed, but you know, there's your before, there's your after. And you can get it to a place where you where you like how it looks. If Are like, you oh, great question. So um, down in the layers panel, you have these little eyeballs. You see these next on the left of the layers. Mm -hmm. See where my mouse is. And if you unclick that, you hide a layer. You hide a layer, and that's where the power of layers really comes in because you can always hide them to look at them. Like if you're not sure that that looked good and you want to try again a second time, you can hide that, make a new layer, do the whole thing again, and then compare. You can also take this layer and say, I hate this layer, and drag it to the trash. And then you can go control and Z to control Z to undo. And yes. So I erased a little bit of her, like I cloned much and, and now I have an area where I'm like, oops, I, I need to not have that area across there. So, are you, 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 you did all this in a new layer and not the original layer, right? Yeah, so I, I, I can't open that, unfortunately, so I'm working on something else, but I ended up like erasing part of the food by mistake. Um, masking. That is where masking comes in perfectly, but that's going to be jumping ahead a little okay. bit. So if okay. you can hold that, you'll see how great masking is. And, oh my gosh, I have so much stuff I still want to show you guys. I, need to, I might need to speed up a little bit and save questions for the end. Um, so let me show you, that's the basic of cloning. You can get in really close if you want to. Like if you're trying to get an edge done and it's just not looking right, it might mean that you need to get in a little bit closer and it might mean that your brush needs adjusting and sometimes you can't get it to look right until you get in 
really close. And the more that you practice with this, the better it'll start to look. So the other thing that you can use that is sometimes a lot faster is called the spot healing brush. And that shortcut is usually J, but you can also click on this little guy right here. And what the spot healing brush does is it basically, it's just Photoshop being smart. And so you don't even have to pick a point. You just draw on the point and it fixes it. There are two settings on that. Right? You want the spot healing brush and go for content aware. And sometimes this thing works great and it will save you so much time because you don't have to sit there picking a spot to clone from. You know, it's just like one and done. But sometimes it makes a hot mess. That wasn't a good example. All of a sudden it's not, not giving it what I want. A lot of times it'll blur. Yeah, yeah. Some, a lot of times one is better than the other for the job. When the spot healing tool works, it's amazing and it's fast and it's not quite as reliable as the clone stamp, in my opinion. But for like one little chrome. Yeah, done. done. Just one and so, and it will have an easier time if there's less around it that's weird. Like if there's less, it, it doesn't do well if you, have a, if you have a crumb on a gradient. So like when I say a gradient, I mean the shadow right here is changing in color. So if you try to use just a spot correcting on that, it has to do all this calculation. That's a much better place to do a clone stamp. And that has to be on the original though, right? Not a layer. What? You don't do that on a layer though, do you? You have to do it on the original. No. Oh, really? To do this, to do clone stamp? No, 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 the, the spot brush. Oh no, you can do that on a new layer. So over here where it says sample all layers, you just have to make sure that's checked. And anything that you do will be sampling all layers. So I'm going to switch images because I want to also show you guys um, my other favorite set of tools. And they might look different on mine than they're going to look on yours because I've got my little custom. So they are the sponge, dodge, and this is dodge. This little hand scrunching together is burn. And then the little sponge is sponge. For these, you actually can't do a blank new layer. You have to duplicate your layer. So I'm going to duplicate this layer. And then what you can do with the sponge tool is you can either saturate something or you can desaturate it. So if I, hit, I have it set to desaturate right now, 100% flow. So if I were to do this, this is just going to, I wouldn't want to do this, but if I draw, I'm going to take all the saturation out of this until it looks like something disgusting. I've got the burn tool and up here for both the, sh with, for both the dodge and the burn tool, you can do this on the shadows, the midtones, or the highlights, and you can adjust your exposure. So I'm going to go burn on the shadows. I'm going to move up the exposure. I'm going to make this brush bigger. And I can make certain parts of the image go away. The dodge tool is the opposite. The dodge tool will brighten, same thing, the shadows, the midtones, the highlights. So I can say I want to brighten just this area over here. And so the midtones isn't is, is doing something, but let's try the shadows. And that is a really great way. If you've ever taken a picture and you had a window behind it and everything is almost black and you can't see anything because it's got um, the, ref the light behind it dragging away from it, you can bring everything back in using the dodge tool. The problem is that works a lot better in RAW than it does with Photoshop because you usually have to do a lot of dodging to bring that back in, but it works. I've seen amazing things brought back from an image that looked like it had nothing in it. So I'm going to close out of these. 
and I'm going to go back and I'm going to go to the roasted red peppers, which is number two. I did some really minor changes on these and I'm going to just open the image because I don't want to worry about camera raw. What I want to show you guys is one of my favorite ways to use the desaturation sponge tool because I think a lot of us run into this. Um, I hate reflections when they're colorful. I find all of the red on the foil in this photo extremely distracting and I want to get rid of it. And I can use the sponge tool on desaturate to do that. So I'm going to duplicate the layer and I'm going to go to the sponge tool and I'm going to make sure desaturate is selected. I'm going to make the brush a little smaller. We'll zoom in this way. And we're going to start drawing. And we're going to get rid of that horrible red reflection. We'll leave a little underneath because that'll look natural. But the sides, man, the sides look horrible. We're going to get rid of those red sides. And the fun thing about doing this on the second layer is that we can then go back and see what the difference is as soon as this is done. And you're going to be amazed. So I just did the outside. And if I go and I hide the layer that I just did this work on, you can see how much now your eye goes to the red peppers. And Katie, you were asking before about what happens if you accidentally use the clone stamp or any, any of these tools and you go too far in. And that is where masking comes in. So let's say that I decided to start being weird and I just desaturated this whole area and now I've got like this weird thing happening. Down here, this little square with a circle in it is a layer mask. I mentioned ma layer masks earlier. Layer masks are basically, um, they're literally a mask. They cover everything and you can just show what you want to do, what you want to show. If I, you look over here where you've got the layer mask, you can either select the mask to work on. It'll highlight which layer you're working on. You're working on a layer of a layer now. So what I'm going to do, and this will make more sense in a second, is I'm going to go to my brush tool. My brush tool is B, is the keyword, is the key, uh, the key shortcut. I'm going to select black. You can see from, from this that the white is what's here right now. So that means black will bring this back in. Black. Black and white. We're using black and white right now. So if you ever accidentally do something that you don't like, you can create a layer mask and you can really go in and fine tune edges if you're making mistakes or you're not sure. It's kind of like using this beautiful tool that gives you a lot more control over what you're doing because you can then like you can t you can undo and you can redo and you can undo until you get the ref the like right in there in the look that you want. And on the layer mask at any point you can delete it, you can disable it, you can you you can leave it. And I have a couple other examples I can show you, but that's like basically what a layer mask is. Now, in the number three folder, God, time flew by so quickly. I have so much stuff I want to show you guys. I'm going to go to the rosemary cashews. I did a lot of cloning on this backdrop to make it look like this. I got this off of eBay, and I'm not sure what's growing in it. It's disgusting, but it really takes a pretty photo. And that's what it looked like before I took the photo, or before I did the editing on it. 
and then I spent a lot of time going in and cleaning it up and making it look more smooth. But the reason that I'm bringing this up is because this is going to be a much better example of layer masks. Um, layer masks are also part of adjustment layers. Those are the things that I had mentioned briefly earlier. So I think a lot of people, when they go into Photoshop, they go and they, they don't know where anything is. They're looking around. They're trying to find out how do they make something brighter and more contrasted. And they go to image adjustments, and they see all these things. These, this is where you'll find like brightness, contrast, levels, curves, exposure. Um, if you do that there, you're changing the layer itself. And that's kind of a permanent change unless you undo something. But down here, next, there's the layer mask button I showed you before. But next to that, these are adjustment layers. And these are one of my favorite things in Photoshop. So what you can do with these is, let's say, brightness contrast. That's one of the most simple ones. It, 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 has, it has settings, and it has that mask built right in. So let's say I want to make this like way more contrasted. Let's move that above my changes, way more contrasted and way more bright. But like I've got the backdrop looking the way I want now maybe, but I don't like what it's done to the nuts. <laughs> so I can, I can draw on the layer mask and I can bring the nuts back to where they were when I first started. And now I've just made it darker on the backdrop, but not the bowls of nuts. Another one that we might want to play with is levels. Jen, can you just explain really quick why you moved that layer above the high and gross things layer? <laughs> because as soon as I started editing it, I realized that, um, you know how I was saying that adjustment layers are basically like glass and they layer on top of each other, of, like things get layered on top. If I am about to do um, something on the entire thing, on the entire layer, um, but my changes, which were cloned from the original layer, are sitting on top of that, you're going to see wormies. Because oh. <laughs> those are all the little areas that I cloned. And then this, this, um, this mask where I made this change is below that. But if I, move the, if I move this layer on top of that, they're hidden. Does that make sense? Well, so what if this isn't round? You just put the big circle over it. What if it's a shape? How do you get that shape to come forward then and not make, those, make the changes you want in the background, people up darker, and the bowl be lighter? That would be easy because it was a round bowl. Do you want me to find something harder? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like um, yeah, there you go. Well, okay. So let's let's get rid of this. That's valid. Except we're not going to get rid of that. You can use it like a paintbrush. So let's start over here, and let's do. Levels, that's what I was about to do. And I'm going to just make this something that is going to be really easy to see. So I wanted the background and the foil to just be really like white and bright and overexposed and living in a la la land. So now I'm going to go to my brush tool. And believe it or not, that's what they looked like <laughs> before. And I'm going to be a little sloppy here. Like, oh crap, I just went over. That is when you can do X, bring it to white. And you just draw. You just draw where you want something to be. Oh, I went over. Like, oh crap, look at that, I went over. Let's go back to the black color. Does that make sense? So you're, it, you know, round is easy, which is why I use that one for the example, because there's like 20 of these layer 
masks. I'm just thinking of something that looks like a teddy bear. That's no, perfect. no. This is really where it comes into taking your brush and getting it to the right size, getting it to the right opacity, the fill, playing with it, and getting it to look natural. You know, I'm doing something right now that doesn't look natural, but if you keep going in there and... and drawing and, and you know you can really isolate something obviously I don't think most of us are going to be doing this but you can you can go back and forth and isolate it and so like whereas an eraser you'd be getting rid of something with the layer mask you can keep going back and forth until you get the look that you want with it so I have to pick and choose a couple things okay so we're just about out of time, unfortunately, and I, I have so many more things I want to show you guys. If you have like a preference, would you like to see anything in particular? Would you like me to show you some of the other layer masks? Would you like me to show you how I make my headshot look different? Is that a yes for the? Okay, cool. Well, I'm going to just keep going until someone stops me. Someone's going to be like, stop. Okay. Jen headshot. So if I have, this is a JPEG, this isn't a RAW. So this is just going to open right into Photoshop. It's not going to give me the option. And um, Becca, you were asking earlier if there was a way to edit, J I think you were asking if there was a way to edit JPEGs without the, if they weren't RAW, but to have all those tools. Someone was asking me. It wasn't you. Never mind. I'm just picking on you. Under filters, before I forget, there is a camera raw filter that will let you apply all of those features that we saw at the beginning on a JPEG. I just wanted to point that out for those of you that keep shooting in JPEG. So what I'm going to do with this is I'm going to make a copy of my face. And I'm going to do the skin thing first. So I'm, gonna, I'm actually going to blur everything. Under blur, you have all different kinds of blur things. Things. Um, for this one, I'm going to do surface blur. <coughs> and I'm going to do, it sort of gives you a little preview. I'm going to do 50%. And you might not be able to tell on the screen too much, but like it's not an unrealistic blur, but it, 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 blurred, it blurred me. It made me look a little bit unnatural. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a layer mask and the line that I used to remember this stuff is black to conceal white to reveal I'm gonna fill the whole thing with black so that the original comes through and now I'm gonna take a brush and I'm gonna make it white and I'm gonna start painting in the areas where I want to smooth out my skin where my makeup is not not holding up on me. So that is skin smoothing. And you can sort of see this scary looking face appearing in the mask <laughs> on the right. And that's, <laughs> wow. So it is, that's me. And then up here in the top, we've got flatten image, we've got merge visible, we've got all these options for things you can do. I'm just going to flatten this one as I go. Actually, I'm going to make, so we can look at the original one, I'm just going to duplicate it and I'm going to merge these two layers. Then, I'm going to make a new layer. I'm going to zoom in on my sleepiness. I'm going to go to the clone stamp tool. And I'm going to bring down the flow just a little bit. And I'm going to go from under my eye. And I'm going to be sloppy here. And there's a reason. You can't. <laughs> so I always think I don't have bags until I look at my photos. Uh, no, I'm using the clone stamp. I'm cloning from a little bit lower where it's a little bit brighter. And I can go in and I can clone. I see an eye vein. Let's get rid of the eye vein or make it worse. So now I'm going to zoom out and it looks okay, but when you do a before and after, 
it looks a little like doll baby, right? And this is where pulling down on the filler, the opacity of a layer can really make a difference because I can bring them back a little. I can bring them back a little, but they're still not, I'm, I'm still less tired. <laughs> Yay. And then we're going to flatten those two together. We're going to combine those two together. You don't have to do that. You can. I'm doing it right now just so I can do a before and after oh. as I get to it. Like, like the, the more layers you have, the more you have control over going back and making changes later. But it also, if you're not sitting there naming the layers, you might get confused on what you did where. So the other thing that people get wrong a lot is whitening teeth. Whitening teeth is actually has nothing to do with making them brighter. A little bit, but mostly not. I'm going to take this little tool here. Actually, I'm going to take my a round marquee. No, I lied. I'm so indecisive. I'm going to take that. And I'm going to draw. This thing sort of like magically grabs to the area. Ah. And it, damn it. I'm not good at rushing. So watch. I'm going to make a square. <laughs> and I'm going to go, I'm going to right click on it and go layer via copy. Ah! Now, I'm going to make a mask and I'm going to get rid of I'm going to make it 100% opacity, and I'm going to just get rid of everything that's not my mouth. And because I'm masking, I'm not erasing, and if I go over, I can go back in. Now, everybody thinks, so you can see all of me now, but really the only thing, if you look at the layer that I have, is my mouth. Everybody always thinks that, like, uh, Teeth whitening is about brightening it, but the problem is we all drink a lot of coffee, so the problem is actually that our teeth are yellow. So you want to make them more blue, because blue is on the opposite. So I'm just going to merge these two layers together. And no, I'm not. I'm going to go image, adjust, color balance, and I could do, there's a lot of different ways I could do this, but this is the easiest, fastest way. You can do color balance up there where I just showed you, or you can do color balance as an adjustment layer. The nice thing about color balance is I can just really quickly make something more blue. And because of my mouth, I'm making my whole mouth blue, but we're gonna fix that masking. So by making them a little bit more blue, we are making them more white. John, just so you know, you're over time. I know. I was going to wait until someone made me stop. <laughs> I didn't want to interrupt you because it's so informative. Um, can, I, can I push a little longer or should I wrap it up? It's just break time right now. So I don't want to get in everyone's break time. Really. I'll, if you guys want to go, I won't be offended. I'm going to just finish showing how I do this one part. So I can see from looking at this that I need to refine my mask. So I'm just going to bring my lips out a little bit more. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. So, now you can actually go in and dodge these. So I'm using the, do I'm using the dodge tool that I showed you guys earlier, which you can use to brighten. And I'm going to take it to mid-tones. And I'm going to brighten them just a little bit. But if I had brightened them without doing that first step, I would just be making them yellow, more yellow. So with those few things, we've got before and after. And you can also then go in and fix the lip gunk on your teeth with the clone stamp.
That's it. If you guys have any questions and you want to email me, <laughs> thank you.